Welcome back to Classic Game Room for another very special CGR versus Retro Gamer as I'm speaking with Darren Jones, the head editor of Retro Gamer. And Darren, how are you doing today? I'm, um, I'm very well, thanks. We've literally just sent issue 105 to the printers. So um, I'm just starting on 106 and we've got lots of cool things planned for it. Oh, let's get a, a quick heads up preview. What, what's, in, what's in issue 105? Well, we've um, we've got a cool interview with Trip Hawkins because EA were recently yeah. celebrating their 30th anniversary, so we've spoken to him about its beginnings, along with Bill Budge, Gregory Riker, Chris Wilson, and uh, Randy Breen, who worked on Road Rash. I, I was just going to ask about Road Rash. That's the um, that's the main feature, and uh, the cover feature as well. Awesome. And we've got cool things like um, there's a piece on some of the most controversial video games ever made. Um, we've got try, uh, a making of Tempest with Dave Toyer, <laughs> so I'm really pleased about that. So keeping the Atari, keeping the Atari content coming, and then we've also got um, a 25 year reunion with the guys who made Dungeon Master, which was a really cool um, Atari ST game. And then you probably, um, from an American point of view, you probably won't know this guy, but um, back in the 80s, we had a, a um, an athlete called Daley Thompson. He was a very, very famous, um, did the, he did the decathlons right. and uh, various other things in the Olympics. And there was a lot of uh, computer games that came out, and they were in the style of combat school, mm. um, which I think was known as boot camp in America. And uh, basically, we've spoken to the guys who made all the games for that. So there's about four or five of them. And that's to tie in with the incoming Olympics. Uh, yeah. Cool. And, um, uh, so one more thing. Uh, we've also got a piece on classic classic um, arcade games, which have been remade on Xbox Live indie games. And um, a piece on Mario which is a mythical... Uh, Spectrum game that was done by Ultimate back in the day, who are now known by Rare, and uh, that that's the main stuff for the issue. We've got something even better for next next issue, but it's so so good. I think I'll save it for a little while. It's a secret, but what's not a secret is how awesome issue number one hundred three is, and uh, I love the cover design. The cover artwork is really nice on this one. Uh, Retro Gamer celebrates the fortieth anniversary of Atari with a look inside the Atari 2600. Or the, the 2600, as I like to call it. The 2600. Well, it's 2600 reasons <laughs> that, that video games are awesome. That's, that's, I love the Atari 2600. It's, it's, it's the first game console that I really remember playing games on, and probably is the first game console I ever played home console video games on. Darren, what, what went into the inside the Atari 2600 issue of Retro Gamer. How did you come up with the idea? What kind of stuff can readers expect in here? Okay, well, um, it's obviously Atari's birthday, which they've just recently um, obviously had, and there was a lot of promotions on Facebook and stuff. So what we were looking at during was we wanted to do something special with Atari. We wanted to move away from the Atari logo because we've done that in the past, I mm -hmm. think, round about issue 46. So one of the things we don't like doing on Retro Game is while we'll happily put the same topics on the cover, we always like to do something different. Yeah. So we were thinking of, well, you know, if, if you're talking about Atari, what's the most successful thing that you associate them with? And aside from the arcade games, the first thing I think I always think of is the um, 2600 or the VCS. Mm -hmm. So then it was just a case of getting in touch with somebody who knew a lot about the machine, which was Martin uh, Goldberg. Um, he was able to get us some um, fascinating stuff uh, on it with um, Alan Alcorn. And um, you, you might recognize it, but the actual cover we styled on an old Atari advert for a, a game. So if you, like, if you look on Google and if you like search for um, Atari boxes, you'll actually see that, the, um, that this is based on an old um, cover for like I think an Activision game. Okay. So again, the idea is we were just trying to tap into that nostalgia. Oh yeah, I, I remember that. So we tried to put everything. There's a lot more cover lines uh, um, for the main feature where normally we wouldn't necessarily have that. You'd maybe have one big hit, and mm. then you'd have lots of stuff about the mag. But again, the idea was to sell it like an advert. 
So then inside the mag, we obviously, the main feature was the piece on the 2600. We were hoping to speak to Nolan Bushnell, but unfortunately, one, one, um, one interview I had to cancel, and then he had to cancel the other. So that didn't come to pass, but I'm sure we'll get to speak to him in the future. And then to, um, to give the feature, to give the cover a little more pizzazz, we went for the 40 reasons why Atari changed gaming. And that's a, that's a little light-hearted feature. Because <laughs> um, the other thing as well with Atari is obviously it's quite confusing because you've got Atari Inc., which was the original company, mm-hmm. then Atari Corporation, which was taken over by Jack Tramiel. Um, and now the current company is obviously a French company, Infograms, which has brought the Atari name. So rather, rather than focus on a specific company, we just looked at it from a brand point of view. So because, again, to the average consumer... I feel that when you when you say Atari, they're not thinking about all the different Ataris that were and once. They just think of the name and the, the symbol, mm-hmm. and that's the only thing that stayed constant. So we've made we've made obviously the the relevant checks where we felt necessary. So to make sure that you know they know this was Atari Inc. or they know this was Atari Corp. But yeah, it was just because um, the two thousand six hundred piece was so heavy, mm-hmm. we thought we'd have a little lighter feature to um, back it up, and I think it worked out quite well. Well, it always does. You guys always do a, f- a phenomenal job, and I love the retro styling on the cover. It's very catchy. The colors are perfect, too. So whoever designed the cover, good job. Yeah, that's, um, that's a guy called Will Shum, and he's, um, he's very, very talented. Yeah, it's nice. And uh, what else is in here? Because I, if I'm not mistaken, this is the, the one with the Thunder Force 3 article, and I love Thunder yeah. Force 3. Thunder Force 3 is an interesting one because everybody everybody seems to love Thunder Force 4. And Thunder Force 4 is a great game, of course. Mm-hmm. But I, I do feel that Thunder Force 3 doesn't get the recognition it deserves. It's got great pace, great structure. The music in it is fantastic. Mm-hmm. And uh, I just thought, stop it. You know, we'll give it, we'll give it a little two-page heads up. And then maybe we'll get around to covering Thunder Force 4 eventually. One of the other cool things in the issue is uh, the making of Double Dragon. Um, really pleased with this. I mean, getting Japanese developers to talk is always incredibly, incredibly hard. And uh, we were lucky enough to be able to get in touch with uh, Florent Gorges, um, a French journalist who's been doing a lot of um, Japanese coverage over the years. And he was kind enough to translate our questions and um, help us with this article. So it wouldn't have happened without his help. And... um, if I could do a little plug for him, he's currently got a book out called uh, The Great Names of the Video Game Industry Number 4. And it's um, Yoshishi Kishimoto, who is basically the, um, the designer of Double Dragon and also the Kunio series. So again, if you look on like Amazon.com, you should be able to find it. But it's an interesting book. It's only currently in French, but there's lots of cool pictures um, from the developer's personal life. So it's, um, it's quite a fascinating look if only for the pictures and then um briefly going over the the other stuff in the issue we've got a future classic on metroid prime which is a fantastic um gamecube game um there's a look at um the self-preservation society which is basically looking at those people who are still doing their best to preserve gaming Mm -hmm. because one of the interesting things which i think i covered briefly last time we chatted was that a lot of developers don't really seem to appreciate their back catalogs and there's a lot of examples where we've heard of games where the source code has gone missing or where they just don't have R and all the rest. And um, so these guys are, are the ones who are basically trying to restore these games and basically making sure that you know they're either, they're either living on museums or, in the case of a lot of the old 8-bit computers, they back up the tapes and they, they make like duplicates of them that can be saved for future use. They back up the tapes on 5 and a quarter inch floppy disks. Yeah, finishing off the piece, we've got a signature series on Diablo, which tied in with the release of Diablo 3 a month or so back. We've got um, an instant expert on loot drop games, which covers Diablo, um, Champions of Norath, Sacred 2, Borderlands, and all sorts of other titles. And there's a Bluffer's Guide to Flight Simulators, and that mainly came through... Because readers have been asking for it for a while, so we thought, you know, give the readers what they want. We f- we eventually found somebody who could write it, and uh, we got it done. That's the issue, though. And um, yeah, all all in all, I think um, I, f- I think it had some good stuff in it. 
It's tough. I mean, if, if you've got the Atari 2600 and Pitfall on the cover, you know it's, you know it's going to be a good issue right there. But speaking of good issues, Retro Gamer issue 104, which covers 40 years of Pong. And another wonderful cover. This one's hard to miss. And it's just great art design. It's very simple, but you perfectly captured Pong and worked the number 40 into it in the Pong style. And it's, it's, it's so simple, but I, I imagine something that simple is actually very hard to come up with. It looks great. It was, it was incredibly hard to come up with. I mean, one one of the things with it is it's such a minimalist game. Yeah. And um, we were trying all this other stuff, and our director was basically saying, "Look, you've got to be brave with this. You've <laughs> got to be balls out, and you've got to just like you've got to you've got to really shout out that it's forty. And he said, "You know, don't worry if you haven't got lots of clever little designs to it because you can't do that because it's pong." And um, he, he, made, he made the call, and I think it was the right one to make. Um, I do like, I don't know if you go to the letters page, you can see that there's another treatment where we did it in the finish of an arcade machine. Um, but I, I, think, I think the TV set works really, really well, and I love the way we've got the, a little game being played above the E and the R. So, no, it was, a, it was a cool cover, but yeah, it was very, 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 very hard to, um, to get it to a point where we were happy to sign it off. Well, the, 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 the designs, the styling continues within the actual article where you've essentially reflected the look of the Pong arcade machine, which looks really nice. That was actually by our old designer, um, Steve Williams, who used to work on the mag. Well, he was on the mag for about two years or so. Um, he's now on an Xbox magazine, but um, every now and then the, we all the designers will help each other out and, um, yeah, he jumped at the chance to do that, and he's done a great job on it, I think. Well, I love the, uh, you, have, you have the homegrown Pong collection in there, and I don't think that you actually got the Roberts Super Volley X. No, well, again, one of the, one of the things was is that ultimately there's so many yeah. different variations, as you well know, and, um, you know, we could have easily probably filled <laughs> four pages with just those machines. So we just, we, we just went for a selection, so... Apologies if um, anybody's favorite homegrown Pong machine isn't, hasn't been shown. Although you do have uh, some nice quotes in here from people like uh, Trip Hawkins, the founder of Electronic Arts. And if we turn the page over here, oh, there's this guy who looks a lot like <laughs> me. <laughs> What's funny is that I thought Pong was old fashioned in 1982, which is true. It was like it's like the eternal classic game. Once I, when I started playing video games in the early 80s, it was like Pong. Why do I want to play Pong? I could play Arkanoid or Super Breakout or something. And then, you know, now it's just like the simplicity and, and the beauty of Pong. I love it. I mean, it's interesting. Um, Atari, Atari are obviously doing a competition at the moment to remake Pong on iOS for a new generation. And as much as I'm looking forward to it, I bet it's not going to be as good as the original. The controls have so much to do with it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, sliding your finger on a touchscreen or using a joystick just doesn't work for Pong. You need pa good paddle controls. No, no, um, I totally agree with that. Well, what else is in, uh, is in issue 104? Tell me about the rest of it. Okay, then. Well, we've got, um, we've got to make enough Tekken. Well, the Tekken series, actually. It briefly looks at um, Tekken 1, 2, and 3. We've um, got a controversial piece on a series called Kickoff. And, um, Why is it controversial? It's controversial because the person who wrote it isn't the biggest Kickoff fan. But nobody wanted to talk about, nobody wanted to talk about the franchise. So it's, it's taken me about two years to find somebody who was willing to write about it. And I found someone and... I mean, personally, I don't think Kickoff is a massive. It's a. It's an important series because it did a lot of things on the football genre, which were then emulated. Mm -hmm. But it didn't. It didn't really do them well. It did them first, but that didn't necessarily mean they were good. But the um the crown jewel of the um series, Kickoff Two, which I think is very overrated. It just so happened that the writer thought that as well, and um, obviously one. If you go onto our forums, there's like a big, huge, I think, 40-page discussion about, oh, how can you say this about kickoff? And it's good, though, because ultimately it just shows how much passion there is, even now, after all this time, that you know, people 
take a game to their hearts and ultimately they don't want to read about somebody trashing it. Mm-hmm. So I always knew it was going to be a bit contentious as it was, but ultimately there's some really fascinating stuff about the series, which I certainly didn't know. And the way I look at it is if my readers don't know, if I don't know about it, then odds are most of my readers won't as well. Well, what else so, is in here? We've also got a piece on Pitfall, the main adventure, which was obviously um, a really cool little 16-bit update of the original game. I just reviewed that recently, and it's beautiful. That, that's a really nice game. Do you know something? When I was when I was watching Stuart play it, um, I just thought it was a shiny entertainment game because it's got the same super slick animation on games like Aladdin mm-hmm. and One Gym, and I I just for some reason I had it in my head that they'd made it, and then I was quite surprised when I found out that it had been done by Activision internally. But yeah, it's no, it's um yeah, it's, it's a great platformer. And then um, carrying on, we've got um, a Celebration of School Days, which was a popular Spectrum game. And it was an open sandbox game where you'd literally play as a school kid and you could go around the school um, r- m- running havoc and you had to basically steal some stuff from uh, the, your head teacher. And uh, Bully, which came out in, um, which I believe did come out in the US on the PS2, um, they share a lot of similarities. So it's quite interesting to go back to a game that was is like 25 years old and then you realise just how much of an impression it's had on sandbox games in general. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've also got a look at the Vectrex, which, um, again, I think we I mentioned this um, the, the other month. And it's just one of those really... I, I just love the machine. It, it screams old school. Yeah, the Vectrex is when, great. <laughs> when you put it on and you can see the vector, gl- the glow coming off the screen, it's, it's, it's a fantastic piece of kit. And you have one, and, right? Uh, I do, yeah, I do have one. I'm literally I'm looking at it right now. I've only got a couple of games for it, but um, it's one of those things that I keep on promising myself that I'll treat myself to a few games, and then I always forget. So, but yeah, the uh, collector's guide looks at pretty much every single game and peripheral that came out on it. So, if you do want to start collecting for the machine, it gives you, you know, just basically tells you what you should be focusing on. I absolutely. Love the Vectrex, and it's the greatest conversation piece because if you have it out when you have some friends over, nobody knows quite what to make of it until they start playing it, and then they just love it. Yeah, no, it's a it's a fascinating console, and and again, it's one of those it's one of those machines. I think more than anything that does sum up what retro is, and because it's got it's got an almost alien like feel to it, mm-hmm. and it. You, I just remember when I went around one of my friend's houses years and years ago when they first came out, and um, Wayne Kelso, I think his name was, and you know, he, it felt that he had an arcade machine in his home, and that was just mind blowing. I mean, that must have that would have been the early '80s, so I would have been probably about nine or ten. Yeah, and yeah, it's never seen nothing like it. Absolutely gobsmacked, and I've always wanted to own one, and I was lucky enough to. Um, be able to get one off uh, one of our readers, so that one that was works out quite well. Did they sell the Vectrex in the UK? Um, they did. Um, I think I think it was by another company. I think it might have been um, Milton Bradley over okay. in the because um, I think it was GCE over in the states. Yeah, it was GCE it the round, but yeah, um, it was Milton Bradley over here, and Milton Bradley. Um, used to well, they still make a lot of board games and stuff. So it was quite interesting to just see them move into something which they they didn't normally deal with. But yeah, fan, fantastic machine, really, really lovely piece of kit. Well, I'm glad that you gave so you guys gave a lot of real estate to it in the magazine as well. Well, again, I mean that that would be balanced out by the fact that we probably won't do anything major on it for a few months now. Cause no, no, I don't want to hear that. We need more Vectrex well, coverage. There's too much stuff to cover, isn't it? That's the, the that's the biggest sodden problem with this magazine. There is literally so much good crap out there that you just want to stick in there, and you can't put it in every single issue as much as you want to. Um, it's like, for example, we're doing a PC Engine piece in issue one one hundred and six because people have been going on and on and on, yeah. on about. It. So, but again, you know, all all these systems. As I was saying earlier with Kickoff, every, they, they've all got their fans, and uh, a lot of people read retro gaming because they want that nostalgia buzz, and they want to be reminded of the stuff that they loved playing when they were kids. 
So you you just have you you're just always trying to keep everybody happy, and it's a very difficult thing to do. All right, well, I think you do a good job. And then um, the the rest of the issue is is a lot more geared to the UK scene. We've got a a piece on the GameCube to celebrate the fact that it's recently turned ten years old in the UK. Mm-hmm. We got a piece on working class heroes, which um, uh, talks to various developers, including um, the creator of Paperboy and Tapper. And it just looks at how back in the 80s, um, a lot of video games were just inspired by people with everyday jobs like a paper boy, um, a barman, a dustman. And it, it just basically talks about, you know, why, why they decided to use those for inspiration yeah. and, you know, what, what they did to turn, you know, things like Mario into get really popular games. Mm-hmm. And then um, we've got a company profile on... A company called Electric Dreams, which was um, it was effectively Activision's UK arm. Okay, and they um, they published a lot of Activision's eight bit games over here, and they started doing a few licenses for things like, for example, R Type, the Aliens films uh, back in the day, and the truly terrible Big Trouble in Little China, which was <laughs> a, which was a I love the film, but the game was absolutely awful. And then we finish off with a fairly big interview on Nick Jones, who has worked on Earthworm Jim, um, Cybernoid, Smash TV, um, Supremacy, and he's still in the industry today working on NFL games for 2K. Well, these are two fabulous back-to-back issues, Darren, and you've got your work cut out to keep the next couple as good. Well, we've got, we got a few, we got a few um, tricks up our sleeves, so... I, I'm 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 confident that you're going to like what you see when they eventually turn up. I'm pretty sure I, I will. I read every one and I love them. And let me ask you this: How do viewers stay in touch with Retro Gamer, and how do they get a subscription? Well, again, if um if you want to get in touch with us, because we're quite uh, vocal on our forums, so you can go to www.retrogamer.net forward slash forum. And that will basically, um, you can sign up on there and you can join in the, the discussions or just give us feedback about the Mac. So, you know, if there's something that you really want us to cover, um, let us know in feedback and we'll do our best to get it in the issue. Alternatively, if you want to take out a subscription, I can appreciate that it is expensive overseas, but um, I, I do think you get your money's worth. And that's www.imaginesubs.co.uk forward slash RET for retro. The print magazine is expensive by at least U.S. standards, but it's worth every penny. I highly recommend that you guys all subscribe to Retro Gamer. But there's actually another way that viewers can enjoy the magazine, Darren. What is that? Um, Well, we have actually got the magazines in digital form. So if you've got, like, access to an iPad, or um, alternatively, if you've got, like, an Android and you use something like Xenio or... um, you. You can basically get it at a far cheaper price than what you'd pay for the print version. Is it on the Vectrex? It's unfortunately not on the Vectrex, no. It would look great on the Vectrex. Okay, well, if it's on the iPad, it's got to be on the Vectrex as well. Yep. I mean, all you need to do is just search on the newsstand or the apps for Retro Gamer, and you'll see it come up. And, yeah, I think it's about $5, I think. Which I think is um, a lot, well, I, I know it's a good, it's a lot cheaper than the um, print version, basically, so you'd save some cash that way. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Darren Jones, the head editor of Retro Gamer, available in print, digitally, and hopefully on the Vectrex. I'm going to talk you into that. <laughs> Thanks for taking the time to talk, Darren, on another CGR versus Retro Gamer, and we will talk again soon. Always a pleasure, Mark. Always a pleasure. Thank you.